Okay, so the last lecture we talked about uh, some significant issues. We talked about auto ignition and we talked about uh, spontaneous ignition. And uh, now I'd like to talk about ignition of liquids. And so uh, we're, we're, we're now moving more to fire safety issues and concerns. So we imagine that we have uh, some pool of some liquid hydrocarbon and uh, that there is a continuous spark or pilot above this pool. And we ask the question, what are the conditions that would allow flammability or the a flame to occur over this, uh, over this pool? What we're going to look at is that the thermodynamics of the system and the heat and mass transfer issues are going to drive the concentration in the vicinity of this pilot. So again, the pilot is a spark. It could be an open flame, etc. And just as an example, you imagine that if you had a pool of diesel fuel and uh, it's you're you're in Minnesota in the winter, you can have a spark or a match above this pool of diesel fuel, and not a whole lot is going to happen. And so the uh, partial pressure, the volatility of the fuel, which is determined by the environmental conditions and whatever heat and mass transfer conditions are occurring, are going to dictate whether or not there's enough fuel vapor in the vicinity of the pilot to make it sit within this flammable mixture zone. So the question really that's posed is, is the mole fraction or volume fraction at that location bounded by the upper and lower flammability limits? So some time ago we talked about lower flammability limits. So lower flammability mole fraction and the upper flammability limit. So uh, please review your notes on that. And that pushes us to understand what's going to happen in some of these problems. So uh, this is going to allow us, this description will allow us to understand better two other descriptors of, uh, of liquid uh, fuels, and this is a flash point temperature and a fire point temperature. So the flash point temperature, as specified here, is a temperature of this pool at which when you introduce this pilot, you get a flash flame that propagates across, it, across, the, across the pool. So it's, it's, you have this premixed flame that just propagates across and then sort of collapses on itself. The fire point temperature is the temperature where you introduce that pilot and you get a self-sustaining flame above it. What's the difference? The difference is that uh, at the higher temperature, you already have enough volatile flux that's coming off of the fuel bed that when you introduce the pilot and you introduce this premix flame above it, the heat transfer from that premix flame into the fuel bed supports the additional flux required to generate in sort of in enough time this diffusion flame above the uh, the pool. In the flash point case, uh, you just have generated enough vapor to have mixed with the oxidant to allow it to be just uh, just flammable, and so just premix enough that it's flammable and allows this flash wire uh, above. So again, flash point temperature, no sustained burning. Fire point temperature, it is sustained and you get steady burning. And not surprisingly, fire point temperature is greater than the flash point temperature. 
Um, we already said this. The ignition process requires that a premix flame is supported above a pool by the pilot, and the mole fraction near the pilot, so I'm, I'm trying to show spark here. So the, uh, that looks like an X. So this is supposed to be a battery or an electrode of some sort. Uh, the mole fraction near the pilot should be between the lower and upper flammable regions. So this problem, it's a coupled heat mass transfer problem with uh, a thermodynamic analysis. And what the thermodynamic analysis does is it tells us what the partial pressure is for a particular value of the uh, liquid temperature. So this, uh, this, analysis, this analysis, this piece of it, is just understanding what the saturation properties of this uh, system are. Because again, obviously, we, we have a two-phase system. We have a liquid in equilibrium with its uh, vapor. So we have a liquid vapor equilibrium. We understand that that liquid vapor equilibrium, P and T, are not independent. So uh, as far as the evaporation analysis, when we talk about the vapor pressure or the partial pressure of that vapor relative to the total pressure, we understand that that is a mole fraction. Okay, so the mole fraction, the vapor pressure at the surface is the saturation pressure. When it's divided by the total pressure of the system, that is the mole fraction of vapor. What I'm trying to show here is that if you were looking at the introduction of, so say we put a pan of methanol into a closed compartment. So somebody's well-sealed shed, and that shed just had air in it before. And there's going to be a temperature, so we, we imagine that we're at some temperature. Well, Heat mass transfer processes occur such that we're going to have a mole fraction of that methanol or other vapor immediately that's going to be the saturation value um, at the surface. And over time, diffusional processes and if there's mixing convective processes will cause the vapor pressure inside to equilibrate such that we are no longer evaporating this methanol or whatever liquid it is. So at equilibrium, our P vapor, infi our P infinity, our, our pressure, vapor partial pressure at infinity for this system is the same as what it is on the surface and we no longer, there's no driving potential for mass transfer and the whole system uh, has an equilibrium amount of the vapor pressure inside. So, so we have to understand that there's, there's a time where there are transients in terms of the transport issues, slash mixing, and a time where, if it's sufficiently long, where it's in equilibrium. And so the question of where the pilot is is important, obviously, in terms of the transport mixing time. So if the, if the pilot is, you know, in the corner of this room, it's going to take a long time before we're in a position to ignite it, even if we are, even if the equilibrium value of, uh, of X vapor is within the flammable regime. So uh, from a fire testing perspective, there are two types of, uh, of flashpoint measurements, and one is called an open, open cup test and the other is a closed cup test.
And we've already really diagrammed what it looks like. It's really just a pilot over the uh, over a flammable uh, mixture. So here are typical values of closed cup flashpoint temperatures. So we see that there are uh, very volatile systems and relatively non-volatile system. So you look at uh, motor oil. So you have to heat motor oil to 216 degrees Celsius before motor oil is going to uh, flash above it. Uh, methanol, 12 degrees C, and hexane, 20, minus 22 degrees C. So wide range of values uh, and this obviously has an implication in terms of the hazards associated with transportation and, and storage of these types of, uh, of these uh, systems. Uh, fire point temperatures, again, higher than the uh, flash point temperatures. So, you know, 177 versus 176, 224 versus 216. So there are liquid classification schemes that depend on uh, these fire point and flash point temperatures. And uh, so in the U.S., uh, we use this, you know, class 1A and 1B uh, class. So there's basically class 1 type materials, class 2 materials, class 3 A and B materials up there. And so we'll give some examples of these, but these have to do with both the flash point temperatures and also the uh, boiling temperatures of the uh, of the liquids. So, uh, class one, it's a flash point one a. I'm sorry, flash point below 23 C, boiling below 100 F, and so you see that again this combination of the flash point temperature and uh, the boiling temperature determines uh, where uh, things sit. So 37 and above uh, 73. Okay, so uh, how do we actually quantitatively estimate the fuel mole fraction at the surface? Well, uh, part of it, as we discussed, is the fact that we are in a two-phase regime, and so P and T are coupled. So if you look at the vapor dome, and so we're looking at a thermodynamic relationship here between a thermodynamic surface or slice of it. So we're looking at a PV diagram where we're looking at uh, lines of constant temperature. So these are isotherms on this PV diagram. And, uh, and, and again, obviously what it says is that in the in this two-phase re region where, so remember that uh, out here we have uh, vapor slash gas, and over here we have uh, compressed liquid or subcooled liquid. So we have liquid out here, vapor over here, and here we're two-phase. And so in this two-phase reg region, uh, P and T are fixed. And uh, once we know P, we know T, et cetera. OK. So um, I, I've mentioned that this problem is a coupled heat mass transfer problem. And so what exactly does that mean? All right, so let's uh, think about a simpler problem. Uh, so let's forget about the. Uh, flammable liquids, et cetera, but you, know, you, you set a saucer of water on your kitchen table and you know from experience and otherwise that it's going to evaporate, possibly. So the issues that drive whether it evaporates or not 
are the concentration of uh, of water vapor in the ambient air, and uh, and any and and really how you're controlling the temperature of that pool, if at all. So, if we look at the interface of this pool, we understand that there's a heat flux that comes in from the exterior. So there's a there's a T infinity and a T surface, and there's a heat transfer process that takes place between the two. And similarly, there is a mass transfer process that occurs. So inside the, so here we're looking at the, this is the free surface. And so this is liquid and this is vapor. So the, and so we're assuming that there's a recession process also. So this thing is receding. So we have a conductive heat flux into the liquid. We have transport of liquid into the free surface and transport a vapor out. There are many different sort of levels of analysis that we can put on this, but we can generally say, so this is, I'm going to call this Q incident. Uh, we can say that this incident heat flux is equal to the difference in the enthalpies of the incoming liquid and outgoing uh, vapor. So this is this latent heat of vaporization. So we're just taking the difference between these guys, plus some uh, heat that's transferred into the liquid. So this is a sensible uh, heat transfer. Now, uh, we need a model for this. And a simple model for this Q incident is just H T infinity minus T S. And we're going to, to first order, neglect this loss into the, uh, or this conduction into the pool. And so we're just going to say that the heat transfer, the incident heat flux is equal to the mass flux times this latent heat of vaporization. We can model the mass flux using a similar law as what we use for the heat flux. And the difference is that we have something called a mass transfer coefficient. Which is actually, uh, you know, to first order, just the heat transfer coefficient divided by the specific heat capacity. So we have a relationship between the temperature difference and the uh, mass fraction difference. So here's that relationship. And we have two unknowns there. So the assumption is that we know T infinity. So for example, if it's ambient conditions, you can say, okay, well, this is 20 degrees Celsius, for example. We might know the relative humidity. So if, say it's dry, we can say the mass fraction of air, mass fraction of air, mass fraction of uh, water in the uh, free stream is zero. And so, and we know, you know, if we use some correlation, so the Neusselt number, HL over K is a way for us to identify what the uh, heat transfer coefficient is. So we can use a correlation to find out what H is. And as we said, HM is just H over C sub P. HFG we look up um, in a thermodynamics book or in a fire book to find out what the latent heat of vaporization is. So we just, we have the unknowns are Ys and Ts, okay? So we have two unknowns, Ys and Ts, and, uh, and what we use to close the system is, uh, is a th this thermodynamic relation called the clausius clapiron equation. And so the clausius clapiron equation tells us the relationship between the pressure at any temperature to the temperature of interest. So Remember we were saying that in that PV diagram, the 
that we're looking for this, we're for, so for any value of t here, or said differently, or any value of p, we want to know what the corresponding value of t is. This relationship, cc, I'll, I'm going to abbreviate it in general, tells us that. To parameterize it, what we require is we need to know the boiling temperature for whatever that system is. So it says, tell me what the boiling temperature is, and I hope you understand what the pressure at when when I say that something's boiling. So if if I asked you if I said okay, or somebody asked you on an exam at uh, you know what is the partial pressure on Earth, of course, uh, and you can give the elevation. What's the partial pressure associated with a boiling temperature of this uh, fluid? Your response should be that the boiling, the partial pressure is atmospheric pressure. So boiling is the process by which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Okay, that, that's, that's, our, that's the definition of boiling. So uh, what this says is that we have parameterized or normalized this such that this is the atmospheric pressure. And what we're saying is that you tell me the boiling temperature at atmospheric conditions, I'll tell you what the pressure is at some other value. And the uh, important parameters here, HFG, of course, is this latent heat that we talked about before. Uh, Mg is the uh, molecular weight, and R is the universal gas constant. Ah, so this is good. This is good because now you're really confused. Because what I just said was, I said to you that we had from the first uh, relationship, we had ys as a function of ts, okay? That's what the uh, heat mass transfer relationships give us. Now I'm telling you we have P vapor at the surface as a function of T S. And what I want you to recognize is P vapor at the surface, we can we could even have set it as X S because we have it relative to atmospheric pressure as a function of T S. And we also know that we have XS as a function of Y S. These are really interchangeable in terms of this. We could have written this as Ys in terms of Ys, basically, okay? Um, in this problem, uh, it, this is from uh, the uh, Quintiri text, again. Uh, the question is, it's problem 6.5. Calculate the vapor pressure of pure liquids, the following pure liquids at zero C. Use Clasius clap iron. So it's, uh, just in case you can't read this, I'm going to rewrite this. N octane. Methanol, and the last one is acetone. So what we do as far as the solution is we identify what the boiling temperatures are. So 398K, 337K, 329K. We find the latent heats, HFG, for each of these. P atmosphere is 101 kPa. The environmental temperature is 273 K. Ideal gas constant is given here. So it's uh, 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. And uh, 
we are, we find the molecular weights. So for this uh, N octane, the N is for normal octane. It's uh, 12 times 8, so 12 times 8 carbons plus 18 hydrogens. So we get 114. Etc. And we simply plug it into the equation we talked about before. So I, I have this P ratio, but this is, you can think about it, mole fraction one, mole fraction two, mole fraction three. And so uh, we find out that the partial pressure, for example, for the uh, N octane is. Uh, Mole fraction is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 3. The pressure associated with it is 8.8 times, 8 .8 times uh, the atmospheric pressure, and it's like 890 Pascal. So. So again, relatively simple to do. Now you might ask, you say, okay, well, in this example, um, there was no coupling. So you say, where was the coupling to the heat mass transfer? It was So what this problem really looks at is it looks at the equilibrium it says hey look I have this thing that's been sitting there for a long time I know the temperature here so I've got you know adiabatic base I know the temperature of this pool I know the T infinity is equal to T pool. My rate of evaporation is equal to my rate of condensation. And so there is no mass transfer process. There is no heat transfer process. My vapor pressure here is equal to the same, is the same as my vapor pressure at the surface. And I just want to understand what that vapor pressure is. So, so in this case, for the cases that we talked about here, T surface is known, and we're finding the corresponding T surface. Okay. Okay. Now, um, as you know, uh, what we talked about earlier is that. If we had mixtures of gases and we're talking about flammability limits, then we have to be able to raise the, so, you know, this is really more, is this flammable? And we talked about this already. So we understand, again, that we have to be between XL and XU. We understand that... Uh, for XL, this corresponds to a T adiabatic of about 1300 C. We understand that for mixtures of fuels, the same result has to apply. And so, I remember last, uh, two lectures ago or so, uh, I was talking to you about this 1 over XL of the mixture in terms of the sum of XI over XL. Well, this is, again, just making that clear because I think that 
uh, I might have confused you a bit there. So in a simple case again, XL is this is whatever value allows us to reach. This is from the energy balance perspective. So this is like from the uh, adiabatic flame temperature calculation. XL is whatever mixture strength allows us to reach 1300 C. If we had a mixture delta HC, so this is a mixture heat of combustion. We would think about that in terms of the mole fractions of the fuel, of the individual fuel components. times the mole, molar heat of combustion. And so it was this XI that I stumbled on because I was, like, I was putting initially the mole fraction in the mixture, but it's the mole fraction in the fuel. And it's more explicit here because then uh, as, we, uh, as we look at the mole fraction, as we look at the overall energy balance, XL mixed times the molar mixture heat of combustion has to equal CP mix times uh, 1300 minus 25, as we've done before, and uh, it you know we we can see that one over X of L has to equal. So we use the definition of the mixture uh, value here. So if you look at if you substitute in XI delta HCI here and uh, identify the individual components with and identify CP mix 1300 minus 25 with uh, XL times uh, delta HCI, then we end up with this relationship. And uh, that's what we're just doing here. So this is our subs substitution. And uh, this is the individual result. And, and again, divide by CP delta T. And we get the results. So again, I want to make it clear that fraction in fuel. So we can couple this with the classic copper iron type relationship. Okay, so um, calculate vapor pressures of liquids at zero C. We, we did this. This is the isooctane case, or the n-octane. Uh, if we have uh, the coupling, uh, then, you know, we looked at the possibility that the there is no conduction into the liquid. So the case where we can neglect conduction into the liquid, there are a couple of cases. One is that we have an adiabatic base and we have a relatively thin uh, fluid medium so that we can get isothermal conditions within the medium. Another possibility is that we have a well-mixed system with the above. Okay, um, if we, uh, so this is, this is what we just talked about. This is just a recap of what we had before. Uh, so I told you the HFG, we look up in the tables, the heat transfer coefficient. We get from uh, a correlation where the correlation is dependent on the velocity. So you know that RE is the Reynolds number. PR is the Prandtl number. So the Reynolds number is a flow quantity. The Prandtl number is a fluid property. So the flow characteristics matter. The fluid characteristics matter. In these parameters, 
New here is the uh, kinematic viscosity. Alpha, you've taught, we, we, we've looked at before, is the thermal diffusivity. U is uh, a characteristic velocity. L is a characteristic length scale. Typically, for laminar flows, M looks like one half. N looks like either one half or one third. Okay, um, and so you know we, we talked about this also that because we have a ys of ts from the coupled heat mass transfer problem and ys and ts from classics clap iron we're looking for the intersection of those two and so a lot of times uh, we'll use a graphical I mean really we could just use some any kind of root finding or you know system of equation solving tool but there's a graphical interpretation for what the uh, equilibrium conditions are. Um, here what I'm showing is uh, how you would convert from a partial pressure description to mass fraction. So So obviously this is our x. Uh, in terms of y, we know what y is. We've talked about this before. It's the density ratio. And, uh, and so again, it's a relatively simple um, modification to get in in terms of, uh, in terms of Classy's clap iron. So Classy's clap iron shows up in here. This is the graphical interpretation I was talking to you about. So here's Classius clap iron. Mm -hmm. y, TS is a function of YS. Here's the coupled heat mass transfer, which has this linear relationship. The intersection of these. is uh, our surface temperature and surface mass fraction. Once we know the surface mass fraction, we know the mass flux of volatiles, so we know the evaporation rate. All right, um, quickly in terms of limiting conditions, we talked about the case where the conduction into the liquid is zero, could be thought about as uh, adiabatic with well mixed conditions. Um, if we had a shallow pool with, say, a cold bottom wall, then we might model the Q liquid as a heat transfer coefficient times the T surface or T wall minus the base temperature. And when we have something called a deep pool, uh, the assumption there is that I'm going to draw it first for a, a slightly different case, a heating case, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. This is better. Okay. So the assumption there is that there is a depth at which the, uh, the temperature profile goes flat. And there is a convective diffusive balance that tells us what the rate 
what the um, what the flux is at the top. So uh, let me see if I am going. No, let's. So let me do that really quickly here. So um, as you know, we're really looking at convection diffusion equations. So interpretation wise, the equation of interest inside this pool is this. The reason that there's a convective term is because we have gone to a frame of reference where the interface is fixed. So we're translating the fluid uh, opposite to what the interface was doing. We can integrate this once, and so in that integration, m dot is constant, and we can integrate from, say, TS surface to some reference value deep inside of it. And similarly, we can integrate uh, the heat flux term from the surface to somewhere deep inside of it. Uh, I'm going to make this, this is a very good question. I'm going to make it R for the reservoir value. But at the reservoir value, there is no gradient, okay? Because we're deep enough, there are no longer gradients. That's why we can neglect this term. This is the term that we're trying to model because that's the surface value. That surface value is then just the convective transport of enthalpy. So that's why this approximation holds uh, for that surface value. All right, so this is a good place for us to stop. And uh, so we've talked about the issues governing uh, liquid ignition, we talked about the fact that it is a coupled heat mass transfer problem with a thermodynamic sort of constraint on top of it. And uh, that thermodynamic constraint is this Clasius Clapiron equation. Very easy equation to manipulate and use. You see how that classification scheme um, can help us understand what flashpoint temperatures are because once we know the mole fraction because of Clausius clap iron, we can identify whether or not that mole fraction of vapor is within the flammable limits. If it is within the flammable limits, it poses a hazard from an ignition perspective. If it's outside of it, it's less of a hazard. Uh, we understand that heat and mass transfer processes modify this and that we have to take those into consideration. We talked about how we might be able to use uh, graphical techniques and just simple analysis to uh, understand different aspects of this problem. Okay, so the next time what we're going to do is we're going to talk about solid ignition, which we'll show to be really, again, a heat transfer analysis, and uh, we'll move on from there.